We're very happy that you chose to join us this afternoon. Um, thought, our thought series program really is to provide some timely and interesting information to our clients and friends. We don't talk about investments. We don't talk about estate planning, but we hope that you find some value in the discussions that we do have. If you're interested in any of our previous thought series presentations, you can go to our website. They're, they're right there. You can hear the recordings. One topic that seems to be coming up consistently is cybersecurity. Every day we hear about companies and individuals who've had personal information compromised. You may have received a letter saying that a company you do business with has been hacked. Hopefully not. It seems like once we have a, a way to circumvent the difficulties and the hacking, they come up with new ways to do it. So today with us, we have Jeffrey Stutzman. He's an expert at information security with over 30 years of experience, and he's the founder and chief executive officer of Trusted Internet. Jeff is also a former director at the Department of Defense Cyber Crime Center. He was Chief Information Security Officer at Northrop Grumman Electronics, where he oversaw the company's cyber threat and analysis team. He got to chase cyber spies. Jeff is a former Navy intelligence officer and through a partnership with Carnegie Mellon University and the HoneyNet Project, he developed technologies and techniques used in almost every information security toolkit worldwide. I'm sure we'll be terrified once Jeff lets us know of our vulnerabilities, but hopefully he'll give us some tools to defend our information as well. So have your cybersecurity questions ready for Jeff following his presentation. You can type them in right below uh, on your screen under Q&A. And Jeff, thank you very much for being with us today. You're welcome. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and take just me a set, just a second here. Should be able to see that okay. So good afternoon. My name is Jeff Stutzman. And look, here's what I'd like to be able to do this afternoon, just spend a little bit of time. And I'm going to talk to you in broad strokes about what some of the threats look like out there. <clears throat> some of the things that you're maybe hearing about in the news and what they mean and and then I'm going to walk you through um, Cybersecurity 101. And I'm just going to show you this is what a firewall is, and this is what this is. And, and at the end, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. So I'm going to minimize that screen there. So there we go. So this is the this is like my favorite, <clears throat> one of my favorite slides, right? So you're you're you go down the road and you see one of those big banners that says silver alert or amber alert and you know be on the lookout for a 2020 red toyota highlander license plate texas ger 515. so when you see those big things up there you know that you know every license plate plate reader every easy pass sensor every motion detector everything that's happening on that highway is looking for that little red highlander and if it's spotted, you know, it'll probably be tracked down pretty quickly by the police, maybe stopped at the next toll or whatever, and somebody will be questioned, the threat will be mitigated. Well, this is what we do in, in cyberspace. So we get intelligence, and we know the bad things that are happening on the internet, and we watch networks, your homes, typically, we do a lot of homes, uh, or companies, and we just watch for things going in and out, and we're looking to find out if any of the things that we see are like that little red Toyota Highlander, and it's going to be a problem. And if it is, then we defend against it, and we move on to the next one. Let me get my, there we go, get my mouse straight. So I'm going to start off <coughs> by just talking about um, three very general classifications of threats that, that could potentially hit your your home or work networks. Opportunistic, targeted, and collateral damage. And, and as, a, as a standard user, that's really all you kind of have to know at this point. But here's the way it works. 
opportunistic attacks are where um, somebody downloads a tool, they've never probably used it before, they hit execute, and all of a sudden it goes wild and it starts scouring the internet for anything that it knows how to break into. <clears throat> Some of these are very simple. They look for one thing, a username and a password that's maybe a default setting, admin, admin, or some of them are more complex where they look for 200 different things. They run through every attack type that they know in their, in their toolkit. And if, and if one of them happens to be vulnerable, a computer happens to be vulnerable, it'll break in, automatically compromise the machine. And then it'll send out a beacon called a command and control to, to whoever pulled that trigger. So <clears throat> opportunistic attacks are high probability Generally, they're lower impact, but they can get high pretty quick. Some of these, some of these automated tools out there are, are, are bad. The majority of them are a little simpler. Um, ransomware comes out of these things, keystroke loggers, password theft. So ransomware will encrypt your computer until you pay, you pay a ransom. And then they give you a key and you can unlock it and go from there. Keystroke loggers will capture your usernames and passwords banking usernames and passwords typically. And then password theft is, it's gonna come in and try to steal all the passwords in your computer so that they can try to use them in some of your, some of your other accounts. So these are generally automated, usually high speed. The motive for them is protest, a lot of financial gain, just simple cybercrime and theft. This is what it looks like. Um, so this is taken from my security operations center. We run a a 24 seven watch on all of our clients. <clears throat> this one here, <clears throat> excuse me, this one here that I've, this first one that I've, I've highlighted, Blada Bindi, botnet means it's a robot network, botnet, high speed automated attack. In this case, there were three of them in this time frame that I looked at. So what it was oh, about 12 hours or something. So Blada Bindi, though, is an automated attack tool that's used to steal usernames and passwords from the computers that it infects. <clears throat> Ghost rat, rat means remote access Trojan. So if this gets on your computer to the attacker, it'll look like he's sitting in front of your window, right in front of your, right in front of your Microsoft Windows uh, operating system desktop or, or your Mac or Linux or whatever it is. But Ghost Rat, more importantly, is one of those tools that was used early in the days of cyber espionage. So it's been, it's been basically taken in the last 10 years from, from a manual tool that somebody had to deploy to now it's an automated botnet that's going. Um, Git is, uh, this next one, Git is where a lot of programmers store their code. And so, if you're using the free version of Git, there's a high probability that somebody has exploited it and stolen what you've been working. <clears throat> and then Mirai Botnet, you might remember a couple of years ago, uh, Dyn got hit and the DNS system, which is like the telephone book for the internet, was, was taken offline for several hours. Well, this little Mirai Botnet, that was the culprit. And it's still out there and it'll be out there forever. And it'll keep running and it's going to look for nest cameras and industrial controllers and things like that. And so then here's the breakdown. This is just Q4 from 21. Malware and ransomware were the top two. Account takeover, targeted attacks, misconfigurations. This is what they were looking for throughout. Next one. This is where the pendulum swings completely the other way. Target attacks, low probability, high impact. Targeted attacks are, let's say you are the, <clears throat> the CEO of a company. Almost every CEO that I've worked with has been the victim of a targeted attack. What's that mean? Well, everybody knows that CEOs have control over companies or they have good bank accounts or whatever, but they're usually connected into a lot of different places. So they're, they're a target, right? Ransomware is, is a big one. So companies get hit with targeted attacks and usually the numbers, the numbers can get really big, especially if it's targeted. So last year I did one, well, three years ago, I did one a $700,000 ransom. Shortly after that, I got, a, I got a 911 call for a $40 million ransom in the UK. 
So the numbers can be staggering and they are targeted. Identity theft. This is where they know that you've got things that they want, whether it's the contact list, your customer list, sales information, <clears throat> bank account information. People will try to steal your identity or take over your account. So that last slide where I talked about you know, opportunistic attacks where they're looking to come in and steal your passwords, that's what this is. Once they get your passwords, there's a lot of things that they can do. Um, negative press and social media, we see this all the time. So we deal with, I guess about, I don't know, a third of our business is high net worth and ultra high net worth families. And we see this all the time. So a family has a, has a son or a daughter that was uh, seen at a party and they, you know, and they show up and all of a sudden they're being slandered online. Uh, we get those kinds of calls, but these targeted attacks are no fun for anybody. Typically these are manual. <clears throat> they, um, they, they oftentimes will take, you know, months of reconnaissance by people who are, who are looking to pull them off and they go after both individuals and companies. This was a targeted ransomware attack. So I was having dinner at the Copper Door and I got a call and they said, Jeff, how fast can you be in Houston? And so I was in Houston, I was at dinner up there and I was in Houston by about seven o'clock the next morning. And which was pretty nice because I'd been out there with, I hadn't been home in a while and was enjoying dinner and I was two martinis into the night. So to get to Houston by the next morning was pretty incredible. But, <clears throat> but here's what happened. I walked into a company that had been ransomed for four days and they didn't know that they had a ransomware case. Their entire network had been taken offline. 7,500 employees, 1,000 servers, and all their desktops had been completely encrypted and were being re-encrypted every two hours. And the company didn't even know because the email system had been compromised and it was encrypted and they had no way to get email. And so I went down and was able to figure out I took a guess actually as to who it might, might be. I sent him a note and they said, sure enough, it's us. We want a million too. And I said, well, it's after hours. We're not going to be able to get that. And they said, well, <clears throat> you know, how about this? And we ended up at $700,000. This is what $100,000 in Bitcoin at the time looked like. We, put, we posted seven of these to the internet. And then we got a key, a decryption key. First one didn't work. So we sent them another note. They put us in touch with their help desk. So this, this ransomware outfit in Eastern Europe had a help desk in case their, their encryption key didn't work. <clears throat> 12 hours later, we had this company back in operation. They had already stopped trading out of the, uh, on the NASDAQ. They had had an 8K ready to go. And they were within 24 hours of an extinction event because they didn't have enough cash to carry on. And they really had no way of dealing with it, other manual stuff, right? So we, uh, 12, 12 hours later, they were back in business. This is another, you know, kind of what targeted attacks are, are looking like more and more these days. You've heard of a lot of these things. So Colonial Pipeline was a big ransomware case. Uh, Equifax was a data breach where somebody had gone out and they scanned the Equifax network and they found <clears throat> they found one hole. Equifax is actually pretty good at keeping their systems up to date and patched, but they found one hole and it got them into a whole lot of trouble. F-35, almost the entire airplane. You can see this is a picture of the Chinese version of the F-35. Uh, I think they call it Strike Lightning 2 or something like that. I don't remember now, but, but the fact is, is that a lot of that F-35 data was stolen across the internet and they've had to make modifications to be able to continue to do it. And of course the OPM breach, right? So every military person, every person that works for the government, anybody that has a, a DOD security clearance had really, really personal information in this database and all of it has been stolen probably for targeting. This is the third one. And this is a really big deal, collateral damage. So in traditional warfare, you know, you, you fire a missile, 
and you hit your target, but the blast is so big it kills other people too. That's called collateral damage. It's not much different in cyberspace. So ransomware, you know, it'll hit something, but there's a ripple effect. The motive is always going to be financial with ransomware. Damaging malware, right? So there was one that was identified by Microsoft in December that we're now seeing used in Russia and the Ukraine. And then for larger banks and high net worth families, it's going to be targeted, probably. The Russian oligarchs right now have sanctioned assets. My expectation is that we'll see ransomware come out of Russia like we did in 2014 when they were interacting with Ukraine over Crimea. So if any of you remember, we got hit with two big ransomware events that just went like wildfire. Both of them were actually aimed at Ukraine. Both of them jumped out of the battle space and took off across the globe. Um, Want to cry and then not pet you. And then the third one was, was later bad rabbit. But <clears throat> Financial gain, revenge, hacktivism doesn't really matter when you start firing cyber missiles into an area. They're going to break loose. And here's, here's what I'm going to show you. Um, these are, this is taken from a, a site called Shodan. And you'll see top services up here. HTTP is the number one place that companies get attacked. The rest of these are kind of protected DNS. And there's a bunch more that fall out below that. And of course, these are the organizations, but anywhere these services show up is a red dot. So there are roughly 1.8 million computers in Ukraine right now that are open to be attacked by, let's say, Russian hackers if they chose to do that. Here's the problem. In the United States, there are 232 million computers with those same open ports. So when one of those automated high-speed robot you know, botnet networks, when somebody pulls the trigger on one of those little pieces of code and they think that they're targeting something in Ukraine, that botnet can't tell the difference whether it's Ukraine or the United States, which is exactly what happened a few years ago with those big ransomware events that were in the news. All right, so I'm going to just take a second. I'm going to introduce myself and my team, and then I'm going to get back to here's the lesson. So, uh, you know, as you heard, I was a Navy intelligence officer until 2001, doing information warfare for the Navy. At the time, there was no U.S. Cyber Command. I was kind of one of the early guys. And I went to work for Cisco in Northrop Grumman, and I've worked for Carnegie Mellon twice. And then I was the dice director at the DOD Cyber Crime Center, running spies out of out of networks. And then since 2012, <clears throat> I've been an entrepreneur. My number two helicopter pilot, Amanda, she runs services for us, came out of the Marine Corps. Nate Paddock hired him out of Dartmouth. And Nate is a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel who ran the Air Force's uh, Security Operations Center. Sagil runs my SOC. She's in pa or, uh, Singapore. Mark Constantino hired him out of Convenient MD. And before that, he was up at Dartmouth as well. He's my director of IT. Adam Lang, Air Force Incident Response Team. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, he's been working with me on and off for years. And Paul Wagner is one of our part-timers. He's, he's actually the head of IT for the University of Arizona. And then he doubles with us as a virtual chief information security officer. So <clears throat> largely veteran run, and the reason is we just get things done, right? That's the whole idea. Here's the other thing. 80% of my team has master's degrees. Most of the companies in my space staff with new college graduates and high school people, and they're great, but they take a lot of teaching, right? They take a lot of time, and, and I don't want to take that kind of time to teach them right now. So I've hired people who, are, who have 10 years experience and master's degrees, that's the way they staff, and then they get to pick the people that they bring in as their, as their, um, you know, their mentor protege. Period. Okay, so <coughs> we deal. <coughs> excuse me. We deal with all kinds of companies. Uh, we have a whole bunch of companies that are one person. Our largest now is thirty five hundred. Uh, that other one paired back, uh, and they just actually got acquired. So we'll see what happens there. But 
Um, a lot of manufacturing, about a third of our customers are private individuals where we go into their homes and then they put us into their, their companies as well. Okay, so back to the lesson, enough, enough about us. This is not a sales pitch, but this is what we normally see. And this is taken right out of the Netgear installation instruction. This is the picture that they use. This is bad architecture. And, and so even with, you know, they've got these new Comcast Secure Edge that you see online. <clears throat> Those things are meant to protect a lot of people, but really you need to be protected in your home or at your work. And so you want something that's a little bit more adaptable to you. And we'll talk about what that looks like in a minute. This router, this is bad. When there's no protection in front of this router, there's a, there's a tool in here called WRT. What WRT is, it's basically open source code was written by community. They put it on the router and then it tells the router how to operate. But what happens in this situation is bad guys come in through the internet, they pass through your cable modem and they overwrite the code that operates your wireless router or switch or whatever it is. <clears throat> so this is really bad. And, and in many cases, and one I'll show you in a minute, key loggers were the, were the culprit. So here, here's what I would tell you. If you can see any of your smart home devices on your telephone, so can other people. And so I can't tell you how many homes I've gone into where the security cameras have been connected directly into this or into the back of this switch up here and they're compromised right away. Nest cameras, ring devices, it's, you know, all of those things, if they're not protected before the internet, they're gonna get broken into. Perfect example. So this woman is the number two in, in, a, in a financial management firm out in Orange County. <clears throat> she had $82,000 stolen from her bank account in about a three week period. How? Somebody came in through the internet, went through the cable modem, and overwrote the code on her Netgear router with keylogger in front of keylogger code. So what a keylogger does is it captures every keystroke that you put into your computer. But what they're especially looking for is anything with username or password in front of it. So when you do a web form, you fill out a web form to go in your bank, on the back end, your username is tagged username and your password is tagged password. And so they would look for this anytime you filled out a web form. And if they thought it was a bank account, they would automatically collect the username and password. And then they take screenshots of everything that you do while you use that. So we got a call from this woman. We flew out and we took care of her. I flew out to California. I rewired her house. One of the other guys sat with her and called all of her bank accounts and got her her passwords changed, excuse me. Um, and then we were able to get her money back through an insurance claim at the time with LifeLock. During the Ukrainian election back in 2014, I've been tracking these guys for, <clears throat> for a long time, um, smart TVs were used to collect intelligence. <clears throat> so a lot of the smart TVs over there had microphones and cameras and they were being used to eavesdrop on, on the Ukrainian population. Uh, traffic cameras were used to monitor movement, cellular service was denied, and then texting was used for propaganda and psychological operations. And it's all because they had these very simple, very non-secure architectures that we talked about a minute ago. So I got called to Lakeshore Drive up in Chicago, wealthy area, on the on the river or on the on the lake up there and i said why am i here and she goes my nest camera got hacked and i said well how do you know and she said because as i was leaving the house they were on my nest camera telling me don't forget my purse it's on the table so they were watching this woman as she was preparing to leave her house and they were talking to her and she got scared and she called her husband and her husband says, get out of the house. And as she was getting ready to run out of the house, the bad guy said, don't forget your purse, it's on the table. So she ran back and got her purse and she was out. But 
when in this camera, when, when these cameras are not logged in behind something that's going to make them safe, they become an opening into your home. Okay, so this is like, I've given you the really scary part. Now I'm gonna make you feel better. Fixing this stuff is not difficult. You just have to know. So I'm gonna give you cybersecurity 101. So imagine this is your house. Now you've all got private bankers. I'm betting your house looks a lot, a lot nicer than this, but <clears throat> imagine that you have to protect your home from ransomware, from email-based threats, from, from these botnets that we've been talking about, from espionage, from keystroke loggers, from anything that comes along. I'm gonna show you how to do that right now. You probably have all heard the term firewall. This is what a firewall is. It's nothing more than a picket fence or a chain link fence that you put around a computer. That's it. So when you think about a firewall, this is it. Now here's the problem. If you want to surf the web, you have to have port 80 or port 443 open. If you want to have email, you have to have ports open. If you so you have to put doors in this in this protective fence to allow things in and out of your home or business through the firewall. <clears throat> so you've got this beautiful fence that's keeping everything out, but you wanna surf the web and unless you open a door, you can't get in or out. So you're not gonna be able to go out to surf the internet. So this is what you do. Now, sometimes these doors are permanently open, which isn't really helping you, right? Your firewall isn't gonna do much good when the door's open all the time. Sometimes, it's like when you drive up to your gated community, you know, the door will open. Sometimes it's like that and it'll close behind you. It's automatic. And those are really good. But, but in other cases, like if you're constantly surfing the web or, you know, you're on something all day long or your, your audio, your video surveillance system is writing to an NVR, they're very busy, right? And so those doors just kind of stay open. So you've got to find a way <clears throat> to interrogate everything that's coming through the chain link fence and these doors. And so the bouncer and the dog, perfect. The bouncer looks at every single thing that comes through and the dog will chase them away. So your firewall is keeping people out until you open a door. And then when you open the door, an intrusion prevention system interrogates every single thing that is heading for your computer in or out. So you've got somebody there that's looking. So next, what happens if you know something actually makes it into your house? Your brother-in-law comes, that guy that you've hated for years, and he's coughing all over your pot roast, and you want to find a way to mitigate that. You do that with antivirus. So antivirus stops bad things that make it through the firewall, <clears throat> and then make it through the, the intrusion prevention system and all of its tools and finally gets into your home and infects something, antivirus. Threat intelligence basically teaches the dog and the, and the computer new tactics. So we're seeing people that aren't coming through the door, but maybe they're climbing over the fence. So you need to know what that looks like. Or, or that brother-in-law that you hate keeps coming back to the house. Maybe you want to train the bouncer to throw him out. So you show him a picture. This is my brother-in-law. Don't ever let him in again. And hey, by the way, this is what he's going to look like in 10 years. Don't let him in then either. Threat intelligence, that's what it does for you. And what about you know all of the stuff in the cloud? You've got You've got Office 365, you've got Google Mail, you've got Yahoo, you've got, you know, AOL. I still have an AOL account. Um, how do you protect those? It's done the same way. The only difference is they're virtual. And they're tools like Avanon and Proofpoint, Mimecast. They'll all look at your email going in and out, but there are other tools that you can use for Box and Dropbox and some of those kinds of things. They're all out there and they work really well. Okay. Here's what it, well, I'm just gonna pause for a second and see if there are any questions before I jump in. Okay, I don't see any questions. So I'm just gonna continue. <clears throat> Here's what this looks like in real life. This is what we see, bad architecture. 
This is what we do. This is what we like. So this is a reference architecture. Now I'm, I'm I live in New Hampshire. My office is in New Boston. My, I have a home up there. And right now I'm in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. And so two homes, both homes have this architecture. So basically what it is, is I have good antivirus running on every computer. And then I have a second tool that I use called Minerva's Armor. <clears throat> and it tries to kill off anything that bypasses security. And I see there's a question, I'll pause in a second. A little bit further up, there's a firewall. And we want that firewall to have all of the good functionality, right? The picket fence, the bouncer, the dogs, those are, those are called intrusion prevention and DNS filtering and anti-malware. We collect all of that data and we monitor it 24 seven and a VPN, I use a VPN to go back to my firewall in my house so that I'm always safe and I'm always monitored. Okay. Shouldn't we be concerned with having Siri in our homes? Boy, that's a great question. Anything that records your voice should be a concern. Absolutely. So I have the one from Amazon. I'm not going to say her name because she'll chime up behind me. But every day I go up and I clear the conversations. So yeah, it is absolutely a way into your home. And if you do it right, though, it'll be stopped right here. So the way I've got mine set up is, although it listens to conversations, everything that happens on this thing goes through a firewall. And the firewall interrogates it and keeps hackers out. And then, of course, that firewall is monitored by a team. And this is what a firewall looks like. <clears throat> this, is, this is a little one. We use these things. They cost about $2,000. You have to pay a license fee every couple of years, every three years. Um, but it's a next generation firewall. What does that mean? Intrusion prevention systems built in, the bouncer and dog. It's got antivirus built in that will hopefully see those bugs or your brother-in-law and just not let them in. It monitors domain name service. Domain name service DNS is the telephone book for the internet. So for you people out there that are my age, you remember having a telephone book. And I would say, I want to call up, I don't know, Aunt Edith. I'd have to look in the phone number to find Aunt Edith's name, and here's the telephone number. The internet works the same way. So if you want to call Amazon, your computer needs to know Amazon's IP address, telephone number. DNS monitoring does that for you. And then cyber threat intelligence, and there's a whole bunch more stuff than it does. But when you put this right in your home or in your business, right behind where the internet comes in, it does a lot of stuff for you. Really good. We use Forta Client and Minerva's Armor for antivirus and anti evasion. Now, there are some really good tools out there. Forta Client is the one that we use because it can be monitored 24 7 and managed remotely. Home users, Go buy a copy of Sophos, S-O-P-H-O-S. Download that, put it on your phones, computers, whatever else. If you don't use a service like mine, that's what I would recommend. <clears throat> I use Minerva's Armor because it gives me some really cool things, right? We have some deception techniques that we can use that keep specific hackers out of your computers. We use behavioral-based analytics. This is an expert level tool. Um, but we load it up. We use it when we monitor it 24-7. And we're going to talk about the things that you can do. Virtual private networks. Look, this is one of the single best things. And you'll see news, the VPN is dead, blah, 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 nonsense. Total nonsense. VPN is reliable, fast if you do it correctly. Stay away from the free VPN services. If you use a free VPN, they're making money on something. It must be selling your things. Stay away from a VPN service where you don't know who's running it on the back end. So this is the one that we put on every computer and every mobile and every user gets to go back to their firewall or we have another one in Iron Mountain. But VPNs give you encrypted tunneled communications. It's like having, it's like a culvert pipe that diverts water underneath, underneath a bridge. Except at the end of that culvert pipe, I got a guy standing there shooting the alligators and the snakes that are trying to come back in to bite you. That's what a VPN does. It's good. Two-factor authentication. 
most of the banks have already converted to two-factor authentication. You need to do this. Passwords are guessable. Even if they're not guessable, they're oftentimes reused <clears throat> over and over and over. So you have one password that you've made up and you love it. It's 15 characters because that's what everybody at work said you should do. And now you've got to memorize 15 character passwords, upper lower case, two numbers, two special characters, and they all have to be different for every account that you log into. How does that happen? It doesn't. You're going to end up writing them down. You're going to use a password manager. You're going to use the password on whatever, logging into Farmer's Almanac, right? Yankee Magazine, and then Yankee gets hacked. Probably not. I don't know. But Let's just say that for whatever reason, you're logging into a store. Target was a great example. How many, how many passwords got compromised in Target? Or, I mean, there's a dozen of these things every single day. Use two-factor authentication. <clears throat> you want to have a code get sent to you when you're, when you're logging in. So username and password, and then they send you a six-digit code, or you have a generator on your phone. Works really well. And then threats from email, right? So this is this is a really great way to go. This is a, this is a service called Avanon. There are others. We like Avanon, and it looks at all of the malware coming through your email, phishing, data loss prevention, shadow IT. It's low cost, high payoff stuff. Anybody can do it. If you're on a corporate domain, it's the best. And then protect your video surveillance systems. I talked about this earlier. Most cameras are not encrypted. Most of the network video recorders are encrypted, but because they're running so fast, they're decrypting too fast and the door stays open all the time. So do this, video surveillance systems. Key takeaways, and then I'm gonna take some questions. Heightened security threat right now from warfare hacktivists and sympathizers. Ransomware is coming. Russia doesn't have many days of liquid cash left. They're already confiscating businesses for unemployment. Ransomware is coming and it's gonna be widespread and they're gonna be able to bypass the sanctions by, by demanding cryptocurrency. Business email compromise, big deal. Physical security systems, 100% of the time we find these things compromised. Smart home systems are the same way and personal cybersecurity, phones, laptops, things like that when you're traveling. So be proactive. You know, everybody buys insurance and that's good. Insurance will give you money, but it's not gonna reconstitute your company. It's not gonna give you the pictures back on your phone. You're gonna be upset. Physical security systems are almost always compromised. Almost always compromised. Defense in depth doesn't have to be expensive. We put this same architecture in homes but we also use the same architecture in businesses. Doesn't have to be expensive to be good. Know your tools. I can't tell you how many people I know that have gone to Amazon and bought, bought a firewall, a little personal firewall, and they plug them in and it's really sexy, sexy. And they look at their phones and they go, oh, look at all these things that are going on, but they don't know what to do about it. <clears throat> if you buy a tool, take the time to learn how to use it. And then have a plan. I think this is my last slide. Have a plan. If you buy a firewall or one of those little devices and you see something happen, know what to do next. Because it could really be, it could be really bad. It might not be, but it could be. Know what to do. Come up with a plan, practice it. You know, as a kid, we used to practice fire drills in the house. They do them in school. Do the same thing with your cyber. Okay. I am going to take a second. And what is my favorite password management? I use LastPass and I'm a Mac user and I used to use 1Password, that's pretty good. Um, let's see, Sophos, S-O, there you go. Sophos.com, you can download it. It's about 50 bucks a year, does a great job. Like I said, I use Forta Client. Sophos is the other one that I always recommend. Somebody asked me if I recommend Bitdefender. Nope, I recommend Sophos or the one that we use. Um, I use Sophos on my 
my Macs because it's really good, um, but it's also really good on PCs. So I'm gonna breathe, take a swallow of water and see if we have any other questions come in. I guess not. Thanks, Jeff. I do have a couple more. Okay. If, if attacks are so prevalent, should we just get off the internet? <laughs> a lot of people have car accidents. You're going to give up your car? I don't know, right? So, uh, you know, that, that's a that's a that's a great question. But but the fact is, is that even if you get off the internet, everything that you do is tied to the internet. Your banking, your telephone runs through the internet. Your power is controlled through smart, you know, smart, uh, smart meters. Um, you go to the grocery store, you pay, and it happens through the internet. There, there is no way to to, to unconnect or to unhook today. And how expensive is it to deploy some of the equipment you mentioned? So that's a great question, and I didn't put that in, and I normally have it. So that I'm going to just go back. I'm going to go back to this picture. All right. These things, Sophos is going to cost you about $50 a year per computer. Not so bad. Firewall, if you buy something consumer grade, it's not going to be as good. But let's say that you do. You go out and you buy something. They're all, they're all around. The good ones are all around $2,000 with a three-year license. And so at the three years when it renews, you don't buy the hardware again. You pay the you pay a license fee, I think it's about $800 or $1,000, and it's good for three years. Um, VPN comes as part of the bundle for the firewall, so you don't have to pay for that. So, you know, Avanon is, I think it's about 10 bucks a month. So all in, you're, you're going to pay, if you did this yourself, all in, you're going to pay $2,000 for the firewall license, and maybe, maybe $30 a month, you know, per computer at the high end. Um, so not, not so bad. I mean, when you think about the fact, I mean, look, I, I do three-year monitoring contracts and I tell everybody, if you get attacked and you're not protected, the incident response is going to cost you far more than the three-year monitoring contract would have. And so when you're looking at this, let's say it costs you $4,000 to set up your home for protection, totally worth it. Totally worth it. Next question. How do you interact with home-based clients? So the ultra high net worth families always have a staff and we deal with their IT. The lower ones, like, like let's say the millionaires, most of those people don't have staff, but usually they'll say, we want you to call this person, the husband or the wife. And that's the way we work it. If something happens in the middle of the night, if we see something go wrong, the, the person that, you know, that we're told to talk to may or may not be available. So oftentimes, if we think you're sleeping, we'll just quarantine a computer and we'll deal with it in the morning, right after they've had their coffee. Um, in other cases, kind of that middle ground, they always have a family office. And so we, so we, we work with the family office. And the question about McAfee, I'm going to just say that was asked and answered. I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan. It's a, it's a, it's an okay product, but I would stick with the Sophos, and I don't get paid for Sophos. So, um, anyway. And once again, what was the name of the password manager you recommended? I like to use LastPass. All right, we'll wait one more minute, see if there are any other questions. So to the, to the guy with McAfee and the other person with Bitdefender, look, I don't wanna throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm really happy that you've got something running. Um, we just have our preferences and who we, like to, who we like to use. So Jeff, just a couple more questions. Is my phone considered a computer? Absolutely. What about iPads also? Yep. Yep, and in both of those cases, the way that we protect them is to put a VPN on them so that when they, you know, we want to, you want to have a VPN always, and uh, especially when you're traveling overseas. So we always load a VPN on those. I use my own because I want them to come back to my firewalls, but 
you know, Nord is out there and there's some really good ones. Go ahead and, you know, do that. The other thing is um, on the phones and the pads, there is a tool called, uh, it's a Sophos tool, Surprise. Um, I just posted it. Sophos Intercept X for mobile is what I recommend across the board for phones and pads. So it's really, it's really hard to have a good protection scheme on those, but yeah, they're computers and they get hacked just like anything else. And in fact, they get used for crypto mining and all kinds of stuff. So if you, your phone is getting hot and it's the battery's burning down quick and it's a fairly new phone or maybe a couple of years old, high probability that somebody's using it to do other things like mine crypto. So use Sophos Intercept X for mobile. And in fact, I think that's might even be free. And what do you think of Norton? Boy, I, yeah, I mean, I have no real opinion on it. I, I'm not a Norton user. I, I don't use it at all. Again, I'm, if you've got something on your computers and I'm happy, I'm happy about that because that's, that's a step ahead of everybody else, but Norton is consumer grade. Um, I, yeah. And last question. Oh, maybe not. Well, they keep coming in. Where do we go from here and implement recommend your recommendations? So you've got my deck. Feel free to send it out. You can follow it. If you've got an IT provider, you can, you can use your IT provider. Um, I do a lot of work with, you know, like CEJ Computers and Merrimack. If they're, if they're your guys, they can bring us in and we can work through. Or you can call us or you can... Um, this architecture is not rocket science. You should be able to show it to any one of them and say, hey, this is what I want loaded up. Jeff says I need it. So, um, but yeah, any, any of those IT providers out there? Ah, Scott Smith, I love that. Will any of these things slow down performance? Absolutely. Everything that you put on your computer or anything that you put on your network is gonna slow performance. However, I'm gonna just go back a couple of slides. The reason that we use the firewall that we use is because of your question. And where am I here? I should have had a summary. This is really dumb of me. FortiGate 60F is based, there it is right there. So this box is about this big, about that big. And, and the reason that we use it is most of the firewalls out there are nothing more than a computer that brings stuff in and looks at it through software. And you know how slow a computer can be. And so we like Fortinet because everything is run on chips. Hardware-based computing runs exponentially faster than software-based computing. So for the first week after you put this thing in, it's going to be slow a little bit because it's learning what you do. And then once it once it's tuned up and it's ready, it's a Ferrari. So um, they cost about the same as a Cisco or a Palo Alto box or a Sonic wall, um, but it is about four times faster than any of those others. Jeff, what do you think of LifeLock? I like it. I mean, I've got a LifeLock account. Um, now they give you they give you Norton, which is fine. Um, I don't rely on Norton, like I said, but, but the fact is, is that that woman in Orange County, uh, they have a million dollar, they have a million dollar policy, right? So if you get hacked and you've got LifeLock, identity theft, whatever else, is a, there's, there's something to file against. So I think LifeLock has a lot of benefits. I've got, I've got actually them and, and another service that the government bought me because I was part of OPM. Um, I get a lot from the government stuff. I get every now and again, I get something from LifeLock. But I think that that's a, I think that's a, another low cost, high payoff thing. It's cheap. It's about a hundred bucks a year, I think. And, um, you know, just to have somebody that's monitoring your identity and ensures it if you get hacked, that's pretty cool. Can you explain what a VPN is? VPN, virtual private network. And let me think of a better way to describe it. So you've got, um, you're communicating back and forth. 
And ordinarily, your your communication happens through these things called packets. And your packets go out into the internet and they're basically routed all over the place and everybody can see them, right? So you have all probably seen the, the television commercial where the, the, the mailman brings a mail and it's open. Okay, you don't want that. <clears throat> what you want is to talk to somebody in a secure way. So you wanna to talk to the internet or to your company or to your kids or whoever it is you're talking to. And you wanna do that in a secure way. Well, the best way to do it is to have communications from me to you. Still has to go through all of those routers, but it's only gonna go from me to you. And so the way I do that, the way we do that is through a virtual private network. So what that means is I'm gonna set up a, a hard tunnel. It's gonna dedicate bandwidth and it's gonna be a hard tunnel that the communications are gonna go through all of those things and they can't read them. Yes, S-O-P-H-O-S. -O -O it's gonna go through all of those things, all of those servers and nobody can read it on route. And then it gets decrypted on the other end. So it's, like I said, it's, it's kind of like having a big old culvert, right? You, you've got a flood, you want the water to be, to be diverted to, I gotta kill it off for just a second. You want the water to be diverted to, um, to a specific place so you use a concrete culvert pipe. And so you've got, the, you've got water being diverted, but maybe that's a nice little lake where there's a lot of people that live and you don't wanna have all of the critters coming back up. So you put a firewall in front of it, but a, a virtual private network is a, is a tunnel that's built to move your information privately between point A and point B. And the best way to describe that is through a culvert pipe. Did that help? Absolutely. Okay. Thanks so much, Jeff. And once again, this is being recorded. So if you want to hear Jeff, once again, you can go to our website. It should be up in a couple of days and you'd be able to hear the presentation once again. So Jeff, we really appreciate your being here with us today. Thank you for this valuable information, as scary as it may be. At least now we know how to protect ourselves. Pretty straightforward stuff, yeah. All right, thank you so much for having me. Have a great day. Thank you.